slain to receive power and divinity and wisdom and strength and honor. To him belong glory and power forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And brothers and sisters, as we celebrate the feast of Christ the King, let us now call to mind our sins and ask the Lord for mercy. You were sent to heal the contrite of heart, Lord have mercy. Call sinners to repentance, Christ have mercy. You plead for us at the Father's right hand, Lord have mercy. Almighty God, have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to life everlasting. Glory is your name, O oh Lord. 
Let us pray. Almighty, ever living God, whose will is to restore all things in your beloved Son, the King of the universe, grant, we pray, that the whole creation set free from slavery may render your majesty service and ceaselessly proclaim your praise. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Daniel. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom, one that shall not be destroyed. The word of the Lord. The Lord is king with majesty enrobed. The Lord is king with majesty enrobed. The Lord has robed himself with might, he has girded himself with power. The world you made firm not to be moved. Your throne has stood firm from of old. From all eternity, O Lord, you are. Truly, your decrees are to be trusted. Holiness is fitting to your house, O Lord, until the end of time. A reading from the book of Revelation. Jesus Christ is the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. Everyone who pierced him and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. The word of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name, in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that is coming. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Oh, yeah.
be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. At that time, Pilate said to Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingship is not of this world. If my kingship were of this world, my servants would fight that I might not be handed over to the Jews. But my kingship is not from this world. Pilate said to him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born. And for this I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. The Gospel of the Lord. Lead questions. Question one, how would you explain today's solemnity to a non-Christian? Question two, Jesus says in the gospel, everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. What truth was Jesus talking about? And how do you show that you hear his voice? Question three, what qualities of Christ, the king, would you love to see in Nigerian leaders and why? Question four, given the conflicts that often arise between the values of God's kingdom and those of the world, how might Christians in Nigeria remain good citizens of heaven and good citizens of the country. Yes. Father, let me attempt question number three. What qualities of Christ the King would I love to see in Nigerian leaders and why? I would love for Nigerian leaders to be honest. Honesty. Yes. Kind, compassionate, and fair, and just. Okay. And, yes, and therefore, they should always have in mind the concept of common good. So are you saying these qualities don't already exist in our leaders? No, they don't. They don't. That's why Nigerian society is so divided. Because for us in Nigeria, leadership is about power. Leadership is about prestige. Leadership is not about service. But the leadership of Jesus Christ is about service. Service to the extent of giving his life so that we may live and live not in fear, but in love towards one another. Okay, so are you hoping that with those qualities, if they are imbibed by our leaders, things will change? Father, if, especially among Christians, even among non-Christians, that quality of justice, fairness, and giving every human being their dignity exists. But when you come to leadership position, you think it's about you, then you've lost it. And that is what is wrong with our Nigerian leaders. They think it's about them and not the service they provide. Thank you. Let's put our hands together for her. Yes. 
I want to answer question one. How would you explain today's solemnity to a non-Christian? Today's solemnity is that of Christ the King. We celebrate Christ as the ruler of our life. Now, talking to a non-Christian, I will let the non-Christian to realize that to live a life of a Christian, I must acknowledge God as the king of my heart. Not just as a worldly king, as many people will see him, as a ruler, but I will see him as someone, as my Lord and Savior. I will see Christ as somebody I look up to for all my decisions. And in that way, wherever I am, whatever I do, whoever I deal with, my decision will always be, what will Christ do if he were going to be with me? Meaning that I will exhibit godly virtues in all ramifications. I will exhibit sacrificial love to everyone around me. I will be totally committed to the will of God. I will live a life like that of the gospel. In other words, in any situation I find myself, in pain, in sorrow, in joy, in comfort, what matters is, am I concerned about others around me? Is what I'm doing, is it according to the will of God? Even if I'm in sorrow, I will be hopeful unto the Lord. Knowing that he is there for me, that in due season, he will take me to the promised land. Okay. So I will encourage the Christian that our life as a Christian is that of looking up to God as our king, as our savior, as our all and all. Okay. In that way, we are relieved of any burden we have. Thank you. Let's Thank put you. our hands together for her. <laughs> yes, sir. I want to attempt question number two. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. What truth was Jesus Christ talking about? Jesus Christ was talking about the truth that he is the Messiah of the world. The son, Messiah of the world. Son of the living God who has come to save the world from the power of sin and death and the grip of Satan. Okay. And that there's no salvation outside him. For his name is the only name given by which we can be saved. That okay. is the only way, the truth, and the life. Okay. Pilate did not understand this and even asked truth. What is the truth? But that is the truth. And how do you show that you hear his voice? By being Christ-like. By being Christ-like. By being the faithful disciple of his. And not just being the faithful disciple of his, but also being a proclaimer of the truth and living the life of the truth. So those who have received the truth must themselves become witnesses to the same truth. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Let's put our hands together for him. Let's hear from Ebenezer. Uh, Father, I still want to add a little to question number two. Okay. What truth was Jesus talking about? The truth he was talking about is the fact that he is truly a king. King, king of kings, lord of lords. The one that controls everything that happens. The ones that will even determine our destination after this world. Uh, St. Paul said in the book of Colossians that he's the head of all principalities and power, which means that he's the head of witches and wizards, that some of us run or we have some fear, a lot of fear. Every Jesus, kind of power. Yes, every kind of power. Whether it is evil or, or good. The ones that people occupy because yes. of God's providence. Every kind of power uh, is under the rulership His dominion. of Jesus. And then the truth is that he's, he has the key, the, the key of the gate of hell. And death. 
in his hand. The truth is that he is coming back. He said he will come back and sometimes we as human beings, we doubt because of the time that has lapsed over the years, over the century. So Whether, we can grow cold yes. because of time. So we need to realize that that having said that, it's going to come to pass. Don't have any iota of doubt that he will come back. He will come back. It is true. Now, he said, I'm the way. It is true that he is the only way. Every other way is not the way. Every other way is a lie. If anybody comes to you that there is any other way outside him, through any other religion that we are all uh, used to, it's a lie. He is the way, and that is the truth. He said, he is the life. That is the truth. There are so many things he said. Father, I, I want to believe that the Holy Spirit will lead you to tell us more about it. But yes. <laughs> so this is the truth that he's talking about. Now, Thank how do, the second part of that question is actually for you. Yes, I realize. So how do you show that you hear his voice? I realize this truth. I realize that whether we like it or not, he will come back. And the, the world will end. Because the, world, the way the world is going now, we are living as if the world will not end. So, what I'm doing on daily basis is to make sure that I adhere strictly to his voice. When I read the Bible, uh, I want to use this opportunity to talk more, a little about the book that Father gave us, the prayer book, the meditation book that he gave us. Sometimes last year, about two years ago. I'm still using it on a daily basis. Because that book is very rich. It talked about, if you, if you are used to it, you, you, you will live through this world. So the, the, book, truth of Christ the book guides up, you yes, each day yes, on what devotional to do book. as a person who hears the yes. voice of God. Yes. Thank you. Let's put our hands together. <laughs> Nobody has attempted question four. And that is very important. Yes. I'd like to attend question number four. Yes, it is correct that there is constant conflict between the values of the kingdom of God and the values of the world, the world. But as Christians, how do we now remain good citizens of heaven? Both kingdoms. And, and at the same time, citizens of the world or the country. Now, as citizens of heaven, by being Christians, Christianity has values. And if you look at the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, it talks about the, the beatitude. That, to us as Christians, is our guide towards eternity. And the values of Christians is clearly stated in the Bible, which Jesus himself proclaimed all through the Gospel. Of forgiveness, love, sacrificial love, compassion, mercy, being just, and so on and so forth. And these are the values of the kingdom. And of course, the values of the world, the pride, prestige, power, we all Almost see. diametrically opposed. Yes. And of course, St. Paul talks about the fact that we have to put to death these vices with their passion. We must attain eternity. Okay. And so... How as, do we manage? Yes, as citizens, we have duties and obligations and responsibilities. For example, paying tax which is about civic integrity. Because when Jesus was confronted in, in, the, in the gospel with the issue of who do we pay tax to, is it right to pay tax to Caesar, and so on and so forth, Jesus answered, clear, he answered by saying that give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to God what is God's. Meaning that as Christians, we should not obviate from our civic responsibility. We have to pay our taxes, which is right. Of course, in this era of electioneering, as good citizens, we can also go out to vote, not to remain indoor and complain and begrudge government. So we can carry out our duties as citizens of country by doing those things that we are required to do to make the country a better place for all of us. In so doing, we are actually also keeping, we are working in tandem with the values of the kingdom. Because the value talks about, the kingdom talks about love, integrity, and so on and so forth. So we can balance this by being good Christians, by upholding the values of the kingdom, in the same way, we will also do well by also upholding those ob um, duties, obligations that have been bestowed upon us as citizens of the country. So if we do that, right. and of course we have a balance, and of course we will not engage ourselves 
the corrupt practices as citizens because we are upholding the values of the kingdom. Right. So, just to follow your, your reasoning, is it then possible for us to be Christians in the world without suffering? Sorry, please, let me get the question again. Is it possible to leave these values of God's kingdom in a world that pro promotes think values that are diametrically opposed to the values of God's kingdom? Now, is it possible to leave those values of God's kingdom in a world without having to suffer? The answer is an emphatic no, Father. No. Yes, because like Father George will say here uh, severally, so many times, that being a Christian, don't think that suffering will not come. Suffering is a certitude. We cannot avoid, it's not a probability. It's a certitude. And so, we cannot avoid that suffering if we want to uphold the tenets of Christianity or the values of the kingdom. And the Messiah himself promised us, if you want to be a follower of mine, you must take up your cross, deny yourself, and come after me. In other words, you cannot be a good citizen of heaven if everything in the world goes well for you. You have to stand up and be counted as children of God's kingdom. Let us put our hands together for you. <laughs> Last, please. Uh, just to add a brief to question. Uh, three and uh, four. One of the qualities I want to add Question number three is truth. That's one of the qualities that I would like to see in our today's Nigerian leaders. And then question number four. For me, to remain a good Nigerian Christian and then a good citizen of heaven, I have to bear in mind that everything I'm doing here on earth that in the end, I'm going to account for it. That judgment must surely come. And then, as a good citizen of the country, I have to bear in mind that legacy and posterity must tell after I'm not in office. Good or point. Legacy and posterity. So if we are conscious of the legacy we leave behind, what, what story will people tell about our existence in this kingdom of the world when we are gone. Let's put our hands together for him. So the feast we celebrate today, this is just a background, was instituted in 1925, relatively still new in the church, below 100 years old, by Pope Pius XI. And he instituted the solemnity of Christ the universal king to demonstrate that Christ was prince of peace to reaffirm Christ as prince of peace in the aftermath of World War I after the first world war untold number of human beings were killed drastic political, cultural, economic and social changes happened across the world and there was no true peace Despite the cessation of hostilities, empires had collapsed. Territories gained and lost. There was a high rise in what is called class divisions, and is still there today. Unbridled nationalism. And for the first time, nations were established throughout Europe without any reference to the Lordship of Christ. The old and new ideologies were spreading across the world and they were taking a firm hold on people's minds, including atheism, the denial that God does not exist. And we know what the Bible says about those who say God does not exist. Psalm 14 verse 1 says, it is the fool who says in his heart that God does not exist. Ideologies like socialism and communism were taking over the world. And so, in his encyclical, the Pope sought to address the evils of his time. He says, in the first encyclical letter, we remember saying, that these manifold evils in the world were due to the fact that majority of men 
had thrust Jesus Christ and his holy law out of their lives. He continued, We said that these had no place in private affair or in politics. And we said further, that as long as individuals and states refused to submit to the rule of our Savior, there will be no really hopeful prospect of a lasting peace among nations. We are seeing plenty of that now. As nations continue to deny the existence of God, to live a life and live on principles that are diametrically opposed to natural law, the law given by God, conflicts will continue to increase. He said, Men must therefore look for the peace of Christ in the kingdom of Christ. And that we promised to do as lay in our power. In the kingdom of Christ, that is, it seemed to us that peace could not be more effectually restored <clears throat> or fixed upon a firmer basis than through the restoration of the empire of our Lord. With these words, the Pope declared the universal kingship of Christ and to be celebrated in the church. And so in the context of the conflict of the kingdoms of the world, the Pope instituted this feast to demonstrate that above all nations of the world, there stands one king and one king only. Jesus Christ the king of the universe. Sadly, sadly, the events that led to the proclamation of the Pope are nothing compared to the events of our current world. Meaning that, as the Pope was moved, as the church of that time was moved, to declare and insist that Christ is the king of the universe, much more than them should we now, because our circumstances have worsened than they used to be. We must live our lives today as Christians bearing in mind that Christ is the king before whom we all must bow. Several biblical passages explicitly declared or identified Christ as king. The Greek text of the Bible usually would give an understanding that Christ or king have the same meaning. The Christ was to be anointed one of God or the anointed one of God as kings were anointed. Kings led the people of God to victory, defeat their enemies, just as they expected the Christ to come and defeat their enemies. The Christ has truly come to defeat the greatest enemy of man, which is death. When the Magi were coming in search of a new child born in Israel, their question to King Herod was, where is the newborn king of the Jews. They asked for the king. But what did Herod do? Herod summoned the experts of the law and asked them where the Messiah, he didn't say king, where the Messiah was to be born. So the Magi asked for a king and Herod was looking for a Messiah. They have the same meaning. At the Annunciation, Luke chapter 1, verse 32 to 33, there we read, when the angel came to declare the birth of Jesus to Mary, he said, he will rule over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. It is only a divine kingship that has no end. And then we read in several passages of the Bible, Jesus being referred to as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 16, there John says, 
the lamp, the lamp which is Jesus crucified will be the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. In our own first reading today, the vision of Daniel also speaks to the same thing. He describes his vision. He says, the Son of Man comes in the clouds. God gives him dominion, glory, and kingdom. All peoples, all nations, and all languages serve him. His dominion is everlasting, and his kingdom cannot be destroyed. You see, these things are being repeated all through the Bible. So the Pope had a biblical backing for what he said. He didn't just declare Jesus as king of kings. It is that Jesus is king of kings. He was only affirming and reaffirming. Daniel's description is echoed in other passages. For instance, that the Lord will reign and return in the clouds. We read in Matthew chapter 24 and then in chapter 26. We read in the Gospel of St. Mark chapter 13 and 14. We also read in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, verses 9 to 11. And in the book of Revelation, it is everywhere. Also, that, also that Jesus and his kingdom will never end, we see in several passages of the kingdom, of the Bible. And in fact, we read in the book of Revelation that the kingdoms of the world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and his reign will never end. Again, in our second reading, we have passages or messages that tell us exactly things that fit with today's message. The second reading tells us three great themes that fit very well with today. It says that Jesus has titles. The titles of Jesus. The fact that Jesus is the principal and faithful witness. That Jesus is the king of the universe. That Jesus will be king over all. And then of his coming kingdom. The titles of Jesus now as witness. Jesus tells us that Jesus tells us that he is the principal witness before God. He is the witness that has experienced God firsthand. He tells Nicodemus, truly, Truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and we bear witness to what we have seen. A witness is one who has an experience to share. We don't tell stories from the clouds. And then we read in John chapter 18 verse 37 where Jesus tells Pilate in today's gospel, For this I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. So, what Jesus tells us all through the Gospels is what he has known. He tells us, no one knows the Father except the Son who comes from the Father. He has seen the Father. The second title that the first reading tells us is about Jesus being firstborn from the dead or of the dead. Some would say first fruits of the dead. What that means is by his resurrection, Jesus is the first to rise. All of us will rise after him, but he is first. And so he occupies that first place of honor as first, first son or firstborn or first fruit. He inherits the father's honor and authority 
He tells us in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, that all authorities in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And so Jesus is the firstborn of all creation, as we read in Colossians chapter 1. He is Lord of the dead, Lord of the living, the universal Lord. The next one, the third title we read from that reading, is that Jesus is the ruler of the kings of the earth. And this is a reminiscence of Psalm 89 verse 27, describing the coming of the Messiah in these words. He says, I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. The highest of the kings of the earth. All kings shall bow before him, and all nations will serve him. So the Pope was just restating the things that are already everywhere in the scripture. It is God himself, therefore, that put the crown on Christ's head, and he shall reign over all and forever. What Jesus did for us. That's the second theme in that reading. And it says, Jesus loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood. And I think all leaders of the world need to learn from this. That you are not leader over others to subdue them for your own security. A leader must be ready to lay down his life for the sake of those he is leading. That is what Jesus did for us. And so Jesus is the perfect illustration of his own teaching when he says, no greater love has a man than to lay down his life for his friends. By his own blood, Jesus purchased us. He ransomed us for God. Jesus has redeemed us from the curse of the law. That's what Paul says. Left to us in our relationship with the law, no one will be saved. Because no one can keep the law perfectly. But with the grace of God, effected by the blood of Christ, we are a saved people. Next, Jesus made us a kingdom, priests to his God. Because of Jesus, we are a royalty of a special kind. Our royalty is not that of the world. We are not princes and princesses in the sense of the world, like what you have around here. We are princes and princesses of a special kind. And through Jesus, we have become the true children of the king. And I say, if we are children of the king of kings, then we are of a lineage than which none can be more royal. Jesus made us priests of God. In the older, the Old Testament or in the old order, only the priest had the right of access to God. The Jews had access only to the temple courts of the Gentiles, the women, and the Israelites. They could go no further. They could not even have access to the court of the priests in the temple. So we don't even have to talk about getting access to the Holy of Holies. But what Jesus did for us, he has made it different for us. Jesus has given us access to God. He fulfills Isaiah's vision of the great days to come when we all shall be called priests of the Lord. By virtue of our baptism, we share in the offices of Christ as priests, prophets, and kings. That is what he has made, done for us. He has made of us. And because of Jesus, access to the presence of God is now open to everyone. We can come boldly. Boldly to the throne of grace. Because for us, Jesus is the new and living way into the presence of God. The next is the theme of the coming 
glory of Christ. He says he will be coming in the clouds. The return of Jesus Christ is a promise that should make us happy. It's a promise that should feed the Christian soul. Our strength and our comfort comes from our hope in the king's return. Christians should not be afraid each time they hear Jesus' second coming. If we are making efforts, if we are suffering, like our brother was explaining, striving to live and stay true to the values of God's kingdom as much as trying our best to stay true to obeying the laws of this kingdom where we all live for now, for a brief moment, if we are truly about that business, we should not be afraid when we hear of Christ's second coming. Our fear, then, will be because we have not kept the laws of our Lord. We have behaved like a stupid servant who thinks that the master is long in coming and goes about getting drunk and beating all the other servants. For such a servant or steward, the coming of the master will be sudden and it will be a fatal day for that steward. So to the enemies of Christ, his return is a threat. It will be an end to the powers of this world, the powers that have held this world in their grip, the powers that throttle the neck of God's children. It will be an end for such. So those powers should be threatened when they hear of the coming of the King of Kings. The supremacy of Jesus is therefore the emphasis of today. And today's feast highlights certain aspects of our faith. First, that Christ existed with God before all creation. That's what we read in John chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So we can fix Christ in place of the word, which he is. In the beginning was Christ, Christ was with God, and Christ was God. Again, we realize from today's celebration that Christ was the agent of creation. St. Paul tells us in Colossians chapter 1 that all things were created through him. Some translations will say, all things were created by him, which is more direct. Again, Christ is the ruler of all creation. That same passage says, all things were created through him and for him, the ruler of all creation. And lastly, it tells us that Christ is the Lord of creation. That same passage, verse 17 says, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things. And all things hold together because of him. So never mind the way the world is going. God is in control, total control of his creation. He is the Lord of his creation. And no one can wrestle the world from the power of God. In today's gospel, Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. Now, not only is his kingship different, it is different because it comes from a different place and it is of a different kind. It's not like the ones we have in the world. His crown is of thorns. That is one difference. His throne is the cross. He sacrificed his life for the world. Not like our leaders that live in tall, tall fences. And what Jesus did was, the same way I have lived my life, you who want to be followers of mine must live that way. That's the kind of kingdom we are talking about. So, 
He sacrificed himself for the world and told his followers to be prepared to sacrifice everything in the same way for the sake of that kingdom. All the kingdoms and kings of the earth will have their moment in history and fade away and die. But the reign of the ruler of, of all kings lasts forever. The kingdoms of this world are shakable and will eventually fall as many did in the past. But the kingdom of Christ stands forever. The kingdoms of the earth operate on the principles of fortune, fame, power, and pleasure. But the everlasting kingdom of Christ thrives on the transcendental principles of love and forgiveness, service and sacrifice, humility and purity. That's the difference. The kingdoms of the world are driven by money and they feed on materialism. But the kingship of Christ, who is the king of kings, himself is abstinent and self-denying. That's the difference. The leaders of this world and their subjects, those they lead, they seek fame and recognition for affirmation. But the universal king we celebrate today is unassuming. He is meek and humble. The powers of this world make their authority felt by controlling, manipulating, maneuvering and oppressing others for selfish purposes. But in the kingdom of Christ, the great serves the least. The prince himself washes the feet of his subjects. And the subjects become great through service of neighbor. That is the kingdom we have been called to be a part of. The kingdoms of the earth are absorbed in the blind pursuit of sensual desires. And the guiding principle is, do it if it feels good. But in the kingdom of Jesus, the one he talks about, pleasing the king is the only desire. And the guiding principle is, do it if you love God. In the kingdom of the world, Truth is going through a tough time. Truth is treason in the kingdom of lies. Speaking the truth is revolutionary. People live their lives guided by fiction. And governments lie for a living. The government officials lie for a living. I'm sure we are very conscious of what that means. Even in our own kingdom here. But in the kingdom of Christ, citizens desire the truth. They live by the truth. And the truth sets them free. In the kingdom of the world, feelings are taken as truth. Today, males declare themselves female and that is their truth. Females declare themselves male and that is their truth, regardless of common sense and obvious contradictions. Instead of adjusting their lives to the truth, the truth has to adjust itself to them. Unfortunately. But in the kingdom of Christ, citizens rely on universal truth. Truth is not a matter of opinion. It's not a matter of how you see it. Truth is truth. It is not relative. If it is relative, it's not truth. That's not the truth Jesus is talking about. It's the truth. Not my truth. Or your truth. It's true for me. I don't know about you. There's nothing like that in the kingdom of Christ. Truth is one. And it stands forever. So. To declare that your own opinion and my own is true. At the same time even when they contradict each other, is to speak nonsense. In the kingdom of Christ, 
Truth is not contradictory. Truth is truth. The solemnity of Christ the King reminds us that we have dual citizenship as we are reflecting during the questions. We are citizens of earthly kingdoms and citizens of Jesus' kingdom. It reminds us that we have a sacred duty to be good citizens of both kingdoms. But again, it reminds us that our earthly citizenship must be informed and be in view of our heavenly citizenship. That's why Peter says, you cannot tell us to obey you and disobey God. Very often, our problem is not proclaiming that Christ is king. We are doing that now. Isn't it? Our problem is living our life as if we truly believed that Christ is king. That's where the problem is. Our problem is that we are not able to live our lives believing and showing that our allegiance to Christ transcends every other allegiance, commitment, and connection. Our problem is that when we pray, thy kingdom come, we don't really mean it. Because if God's kingdom is to reign supreme on earth, it is not just saying, thy kingdom come. It is about making sure that within our sphere of influence, God's kingdom is planted. It is about making sure that God's kingdom is planted in our families, that he reigns in our hearts. That's the way we influence society. It's not just by saying, oh Lord, may your kingdom come. The kingdom of Christ will come into the world, into our homes, through our own efforts. We often suffer the same malady that plagued Pilate. Pilate showed himself as deeply cynical. He was not sincere with Jesus in that trial. He avoided making difficult decisions. And he mocked Jesus with the title of king. Here is your king. And then he wrote and put on his cross, king of the Jews. He didn't mean it, but he was saying the truth. He never knew that he was actually proclaiming the truth the king of the universe. Like him, many Christians are not sincere. Many of us are not sincere with our dealings in our dealings with Christ. Many of us confess Christ as king with their lips or they deny that he is king with their lives. And so to be part of Christ's kingdom Jesus, our King, demands our allegiance, our truth, and our all. The King must reign in our minds, in our wills, and in our hearts. That's the way that the kingdom of God can truly begin to reign. Just as war begins from the heart of man, the peace of Christ can reign, beginning from the hearts of all of us. Many Christians, or let me say, Christians cannot live in the world as though this world is all there is, as though this is their end. So in matters of conflict, in values and principles, Christians must surrender and always remember that they owe their allegiance to the ruler of their final destiny. Our life is not ended here. This is not all there is to life, to us. There is more. And like I said before, in Acts chapter 5, verse 29, Peter says, Obedience to God must always come first. Even as we try to be good citizens of heaven and citizens of here, this kingdom of the world, obedience to God must always come um, best. Paul admonishes those who use the things of this world should not be engrossed in them. For this world as we know it is passing away. It's not here forever. 
we cannot afford to be consumed by worldly affairs and be in danger of missing the way to our true homeland. So don't please the world and then displease the king of your final destiny. If that means anything to you. Origin of Alexandria was reflecting on Jesus and his throne, which is our hearts. And he says, it is necessary for us to purify our hearts because God and sin cannot dwell in the same place. He says, just as righteousness has no partnership with lawlessness, just as light has nothing in common with darkness, and Christ has no agreement with the devil, so the kingdom of God and a kingdom of sin cannot coexist. Christians must keep alive the spirit they have received, the spirit of truth, truth about God, the father of us all, the king of the universe, the creator himself, truth about the fact that this world is passing away, and truth about the fact that there is a next world. When we are afire with the Spirit of God, the world will look very empty to us. It will have very small hold on us. We will let go our hold of the world if we have the Spirit of God. And we will lay hold on things that are eternal. That is what the Spirit of God should help us to achieve. And let these things passing away just pass away while we are preserved waiting for our eternal king. Scripture passages for reflection. Christ's kingship is foretold in several passages of the Old Testament. Here you have that from Micah, Jeremiah, and Isaiah. Jesus himself preached the kingdom when he came in several passages of the New Testament. Mark chapter 1, verse 14 to 15. You shall be called priests of the Lord. That's what Jesus has made of us. Isaiah 61, verse 6. The kingdom of the King of kings and the Lord of lords will last forever. That's what is there in Revelations chapter 19. And Jesus teaches us what it means to be truly great when his disciples were discussing greatness in terms of the world. The one who is great among you must be the one who serves. And the one who wants to be the first among you must be the one who is the slave of all. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise your name for the opportunity to reflect on your kingship. Be the king of our hearts. Amen. Make us worthy of your kingdom. Grant us the grace we need that as we sojourn, as we travel through this world with all that contradicts what we truly hold that comes from you, that your strength may enable us to always look up to you, our final destiny. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us rise and profess our faith. I believe in one God. Father and the Son, who with the Father and the 
Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And I look forward to the resurrection of the dead. The life of the world to come. Amen. Let us now turn to God and pray for ourselves, for the church, and for our country, Nigeria, that continues to be confronted with multiple economic, political, and security challenges. Let us pray that Christ, the King of Kings, who has triumphed over all principalities and powers, given new hope to suffering humanity, will intervene today and transform our circumstances. We pray for the Holy Father, Pope Francis, for the bishops and for Christian leaders everywhere, as we announce to the world today that Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords, may church leaders at all levels be endowed with the grace they require to proclaim the undiluted truth of the gospel in season and out of season. We pray, O oh Lord. For Christians everywhere, that we may really come to appreciate the saving message of Jesus Christ, submit completely to his reign, and be good examples of loving service to the poor. We pray, O oh Lord. For our country, Nigeria, may the political and economic elite come to recognize that leadership is service, especially to the poor and the weak, so that in their planning, they may make adequate provision for the sick, for the homeless, the handicapped, the unemployed, and all other disadvantaged members of our society. We pray, O oh Lord. For all who are suffering religious persecution and others who are victims of terrorists, killer bandits, and kidnappers. May the Lord soon intervene to transform their circumstances unto good. We pray, O Lord. Lord For the success of the evangelization and leadership development programs of the Lux Terra Leadership Foundation, for the intention of its partners and benefactors, we pray, O Lord. Lord Brothers and sisters, let us now take a moment to present our private petitions to God in silence. We pray, O Lord. Lord we pray with Mary, the Queen of Heaven, as we say, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Merciful Father, you love the world so much that you gave up your only son to save us. May your kingdom come, and may your will be done among us now and always, through Christ our Lord.
brothers and sisters, that our sacrifice may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. As we offer you, O Lord, the sacrifice by which the human race is reconciled to you, we humbly pray that your Son himself may bestow on all nations the gifts of unity and peace, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere, to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God. For you anointed your only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, with the oil of gladness as eternal priest and King of all creation, so that by offering himself on the altar of the cross as a spotless sacrifice to bring us peace, he might accomplish the mysteries of human redemption and mankind and making all created things subject to your rule. He might present to the immensity of your majesty an eternal and universal kingdom, a kingdom of truth and life, a kingdom of holiness and grace, a kingdom of justice, love and peace. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory, as without end we acclaim. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts we pray by sending down your spirit upon them like the dew fall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and giving thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith and profess your resurrection until you come again. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity together with Francis our Pope, Ignatius our Bishop, Anselm his Auxiliary, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the blessed apostles and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. 
at the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil deliver us lord we pray from every evil graciously grant peace in our days that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our savior jesus christ Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. We now offer each other the sign of peace. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy to say a word, and my soul shall be healed.
The Lord sits as king forever. The Lord will bless his people with peace. Let us pray. Having received the food of immortality, we ask, O Lord, that glorying in obedience to the commands of Christ, the King of the universe, we may live with him eternally in his heavenly kingdom, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Mass is ended. Let us go in the peace of Christ. <laughs>